Uh, hi, I'm Mark Critter. I'm a co-founder and one of the architects here at Tintree. Uh, I'm going to be talking about scale out. So let me. I don't have any slides, so uh, I'm going to be drawing. Uh, so what what do we mean when we're talking about scale out? You know what what does the user really want when they talk about a system that that scales out? That means we should manage everything as a unit. That means we should be able to add capacity incrementally. That means we should be able to survive failures of individual units. And that's what VM scale out pr provides. It's a very loosely coupled system. Lets you take any group of VM stores, even you know, even our older hybrid models, which are for you instead of to you, put them all together in one pool. And what we'll do is take a look at the VMs that are residing on those individual VM stores. And when one of the VM stores is reaching capacity, we will make a recommendation to move VMs off of that VM store onto others within the same pool. So these present as separate data stores into VMware. They're not a, a single namespace yet. Um, and we can, we can <coughs> argue about whether, whether that's the right approach or not. We prefer something that's very loosely coupled. That means you can add or remove VM stores from the pool at any time. It means we can make recommendations that cross geographical areas in the future rather than that are restricted to just a, a single data center. Um, and it means there's a lot more fa failure isolation and performance isolation, which is very important at scale. We can easily scale to 32 VM stores, which is the maximum that Tinder Global Center supports today, because there's, there's not any internal traffic between these VM stores to make scale out work. It's, it's all done by moving data and by use, leveraging the analytics on a per VM basis that we're already building, that we, we've already built. So um, Kieran, Kieran mentioned uh, Storage DRS. Storage DRS is a good product. Um, DRS is, is a very good product. But the problem with using it for storage is that storage is sort of an iceberg, that Storage DRS sees the live files, but on a mo modern storage array like Tintree, there's a lot more, there's a 90% under the water. You've got snapshots. Snapshots take up space, so if you're running out of space, you'd better take that into account. You'd better move them, and I'll, I'll explain later how we can do that. Um, on the hybrid away, arrays, there's a flash working set. You might be running out of flash instead of running out of capacity or, or front-end performance, and, and it's important to take that into account. On the all-flash arrays, it doesn't matter. You've got protection policies, like, or, or data protection policies, like, uh, sorry, data protection policies or quality service policies. And when the VM moves from one element of the pool to the other, those had better, better be preserved. You don't want the VM to stop being protected just because you had to move it somewhere else because you're running out of space. Again, we need to provide this, this uh, service of treating all the VM stores in the pool as a single unit. It doesn't really matter where the VM's living at the moment. And the final portion of that is, of course, the, the statistics, the analytics we're keeping. If this VM had a problem a week ago, you want to be able to figure out what the heck went on, even if we've moved it somewhere else since then. Or if it's, if it, uh, like Justin said, it's having this periodic performance burst. You want to see that pattern even if we had to move it yesterday. And these are the things that we can do that uh, other products that are not as tightly integrated with Tintry, like Storage DRS or, or VM Turbo, cannot. So I'll, I'll uh, jump into the demo for now. <clears throat> I'm logging into Tintry Global Center, which is our, our uh, federated multi-node management system. And I see the same sort of dashboard, but at the, at the entire cluster level. And this is one of our production systems, so I have to be a little careful. Uh, the the QA, QA team lent it to me for, for today. And they've got two pools to find with a total of, of six VM stores. So. Um, 
you see some summary stats of the pool as a whole. This pool has two VM stores, only 42 virtual machines. It's got uh, quite a bit of space remaining. <coughs> this other pool um, with four VM stores, we're actually running, oops. Sorry, having trouble running the, the fancy mouse here. This VM store is actually, this pool is actually pretty heavy loaded. We see every, uh, I should back up. So what we show in a recommendation, and these are run twice a day, uh, automatically generated, is we show what are the problems we see in the pool? What uh, resources are running out? Is it capacity? Is it performance? Is it flash? Uh, later we may add quality of service limits. Then we say, to solve those problems, we're gonna recommend we move some VMs around. And if you accept our recommendation, on the right-hand side, we show what are the outcomes? What's going to be solved, or potentially what trade-offs are we going to have to make? If we, if we have, have a space problem, we might make an IO problem worse in solving it. Uh, but we'll, we'll, we'll tell you that up front. So all the VM stores in the pools are, are having trouble. Um, but this one in particular is, is the worst off, that we want to, to be at you know, the high 90% flash hit rate on our hybrid arrays, and this guy is only getting 87.3%, uh, which is, is much lower than we like. This is average over the whole week. And uh, so we say, you know, we're going to move some VMs around. We're going to shuffle VMs around to try to make the pool as a whole better. And uh, you can see on the right-hand side, we're reducing the amount of time we spend in high load on most of the VM stores. We're increasing it on one of the VM stores, and we're making that, that sub-90% flash hit rate go all the way up to 99.3%. So the VMs will experience less latency. Everybody, everybody will be happy. We can go look, say, are those VMs I'm particularly interested in moving? Um, the guy who owns the system asked that I not actually press execute, so I'm not going to do that. But we could say, oh, well, this is, a, this is a very important VM. Maybe it's, and we got this direct from customers. Maybe uh, it's the CEO's virtual desktop, and I don't feel good moving it during working hours. I don't care about never moving it, but you know, don't, don't migrate it for now. That's very easy to tell us, and we'll, we'll, sorry, we immediately provide a backup recommendation that maybe, maybe it isn't quite as good, but avoids the VM that the user told us wasn't a good one to move right now. Um, we can also say, okay, um, you know, I don't actually care about this VM store. Maybe I'm decommissioning it. Maybe, uh, you know, it's just a temporary outage, and I know that. Uh, and you can see we, we deselected the problem, and again, uh, we reran our predictions of what will happen when, uh, when the user accepts our recommendation. So, so you're, all, you're actually selecting the VMs and the source VM store to identify which ones to be moved out of you know, however many VMs are on, running on them? Exactly. So. Um, We've got a, a database of 30 days worth of history um, on Tintry Global Center, and that's what we base our predictions off. We feed, that's, that's not a very clear 30 days. That's good enough. Um, and then we feed that into predictive analytics that run over the next week. Uh, Brandon will be up talking about longer term analytics these are predictions of, are we going to run into a problem over the next week? With, with four weeks of data, we figured we shouldn't try to predict a year in advance. We're going to predict a, a week in advance. Mark, so um, are you doing global um, federation of dedupe across all of the boxes? No. Each, each box is still, each array is still self-contained. No re IO requests that come into that box are going to have to be farmed out to somebody else, okay, so like you would do with a global dedupe. Perhaps I'll rephrase it then. Um, in terms of the way you do dedupe on the box, can you identify data that is similar on each of the boxes? 
mm. and therefore the differences between the boxes, because there's a lot of w work to move those VMs around, it, and that's an expensive cost. That, that is something I'd like to do, but we haven't done it yet. Okay. Um, one of the considerations we could build in is how well will the VMs dedupe to each other. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so we, we do take into account Tintree features like snapshots, you know, how much snapshot data is there. Like if <coughs> we also take into account Tintree cloning. So if you migrate something off of one box, it may expand as it goes on to the other box. This is not a, not a work-preserving operation. And, and we try to avoid VMs that do that if we can solve the problem. Um, without causing this space expansion. Are you doing dedupe inline as it comes into the box then? Yes, absolutely. So when you do move it, it's only network traffic, it's costing you in some respects because you, if you do move a VM in and, and it's a very the, similar to another image. Yes, the on, on, on the all flash arrays we do dedupe as it comes in, so multiple copies don't matter um, except, as you said, network, network traffic. traffic. Uh, it matters for the first one. So if you move the first copy, first clone, then you pay the full cost. But once you move the second and third, then that gets, does get amortized. So the execute button will always be a manual hit. It would not be automated. For the first release, we decided it was <coughs> safer to not, uh, not provide an automated mode. That is how we want to go to reduce management overhead. But we figured we'd, we'd give customers the exp some experience with are our predictions actually making sense? Are they solving the problems in a, in a way that they understand? So it's a very similar model to DRS. Is Absolutely. why we're doing it. I mean, yeah. people, we talked about that before. They're fully automated now. Yeah. But before it was. It took them a while. Sure. Yeah. yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah. So, um, and the way we select which VMs to move is we run what if scenarios against the predictive analytics that tells us that there's a problem. So, so I mean, like data protection services that are beyond Tintree, how are they managed across these sorts of storage vMotion solution? Uh, so, for example, the Veeam backup. Or, or Rubrik or Cohesity. Uh, so most of those already operate at the VM level. They're configured with the VM, and they know which data store the VM is living on at the moment. So it's it's not a problem. If you're doing sort of point at a whole volume and copy it off to data domain, pre presumably you're doing that for everything in the pool. Um, so so that works too. Uh, we do have some ability to restrict where you may move a VM, um, and we'll try to work around that. I, I can show that. We also have the ability to we also, um, this, is, this is sort of a crude mechanism, but we don't move things between differently named submounts. So if you have a submount for a particular customer, we won't move that into a different uh, internal customer's submount. That, that, would, that would be bad. Um, so our, our predictive analytics basically look at the history and feed that into various ensemble models to say there's, there's a range of possible outcomes over the next week. Right? If you've been growing, it's, if the capacity usage has been growing, it's likely it's going to continue growing. Uh, if there's been a lot of variability, there's likely to continue to be a lot of variability. And this lets us handle even workloads where VMs quickly come and go. Uh, but we still handle them at a VM level. We look for long-lived VMs that we can move off that will reduce the overall load to make more room for the vari variable workload like a test and dev workload. So we say, you know, there's a particular threshold, like uh, the threshold at which we send space alerts or the threshold at which snapshots stop working or at the worst case, the threshold, the 100% threshold at which uh, no, no writes can happen. We say, how much chance is there that we're actually in that danger zone? And what this lets us do is find VMs that are growing and move them to space to VM stores that they have room to grow on, so we don't have to move them again. Because if we move a VM that's static, the prediction is trend line still going up. We're still in the danger zone. But if we move the VM that's actually causing the problem, then the problem gets solved once and for all. So let me... Um, I'll undo my settings here. Uh, let's see, I promised to show 
uh, migration rules. So because this is a production system, he actually did set up some rules of VMs. He's, he's not interested in migrating. We can also change that to never migrate to a particular VM store, again, at the VM level. Um, more traditional uh, affinity, anti-affinity rules work between pairs of VMs. We'll, we'll get to that eventually. This, this, but the sort of policies you're interested in, each of these uh, exchange instances must run on a different array can be implemented using this. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll do our best to work around those, those problems. And you can tap into those migration rules through a set of APIs for automation, right? Exactly. Uh, that these, everything you see here is, is available in the API. Um, you, can, uh, you can set these automatically. They're not settable through service groups yet, but uh, that's, that's another thing we could do in the future. But, but yes, the, the REST API in PowerShell will let you set up any of those rules. Um, <coughs> As far as when you uh, actually perform the migration, does that mean the storage vMotion data transfer, you know, rehydration and dedu all that's going to occur at that point in time? Or is it something going to be scheduled? Or uh? Uh, We've got several requests to do this scheduling. Um, that is not something we included in the first release. Uh, but I did want to walk through, you know, what happens when we actually switch to a different color, when we actually press that execute button. Um, so, uh, so unfortunately, we don't yet have offload of the live migration. We're looking at that. That's actually easier to do in Hyper-V than it is to do in VMware, but we think it, it is fe feasible to do in both environments and, and hope to get there. But what we do right now is we take the, the snapshots associated with the VM all the Tintry internal data, and we send that to the, the destination array first using our Tintry replication protocol. Uh, this doesn't require a replication license or an explicit setup. We just use the same efficient deduped and compressed data transfer that we've already got to move data, uh, via the snapshots locally between arrays. And if this is an all-flash array, then the live data will dedupe to that. Uh, and then we trigger a call and ask VMware or, Hype, or uh, Hyper-V to do the migration of the live data because they've got the facilities already to, to do this in a live fashion. And like you said, we'd, we'd like to offload that if they, they provided the necessary hooks. Uh, SMB does this with, with ODX offload. It will use it when it's available, and that's, that's coming up in the future for us. So, so you're you think the data will dedupe exactly the same between the two VM stores? Is that what you said? You're, you're migrating the snapshot. It, the it, 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 it will dedupe against the, the we're, we're writing the same block twice here, right? The block is in a snapshot from when it was originally written and it's still live. So it goes, unfortunately, once over the fast replication protocol and once over storage vMotion, and those two will dedupe to each other. The actual dedupe ratio, rate of the whole VM may vary because they're different, uh, different populations. Yeah. Yeah. And so we, we try to estimate that. We, we actually make a conservative estimate of estimate it's going to dedupe the worst of what it's getting now or the worst or you know, the average Historical. on the other yeah. side. Yeah. Um, is that dedicated networking between the two nodes, or is it just over an existing like? It's it's just over the existing one, which which is a, a good um, point to plug our automated QoS already, because in a lot of systems you're very worried about what is the impact of this heavy migration flow on all my normal workloads. Well, that's what we built the automated QoS to handle. Uh, so the system's already been handling this just fine for our customers for years. Um, the, the normal traffic of the, <coughs> of the VMs that are not being migrated is already protected by getting their own lane separate from the, the heavy migration traffic applied to a different VM. And 
I mean, I think that's a good point. You only have to move data when you move it in this case, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas you look at a traditional clustered file system, every write and every read are getting bounced across that backplane, right? All right. Um, so, like I said, I, I apologize for not uh, actually pressing the button, but it's actually very boring, which we intend it to be. You know, we automate this process and we, we just tell you where it's in it. Um, it's cancelable at any time. It's, uh, you know, we report the status at an end. So I can show that. I don't know that he's ever uh, executed one of our recommendations yet, but we can go back and look at the last 30 days of history and say, you know, uh, have we always been detecting this problem? Are we consistent in our recommendation? If this was actually accepted, then we could you know, pop that list open and uh, see what actually happened. Again, because this, this wasn't accepted, it's, it's just saying what was in the recommendation. Uh, these are all filterable like our other tables. Um, you can uh, so it's, fil it's, filter by destination. It's, it's not storage v motion, it's just. Uh, it, it is storage v motion. Okay. We, 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 we first use our fast protocol for the snap part we can, and then we yeah, use. Okay. Uh, storage view motion or VMware live uh, Hyper V live migration for the parts we can. Yeah. And the federation has to be so. If I have multiple hypervisors in the shop, the federation has to be by hypervisor or not. Or um, so I have thirty-two VM stores, sixteen. You know, we we will work as best we can with the topology that the customer has set up. We encourage <coughs> a full mesh to give us the most uh, chance to find a good solution. Uh, but if we create a pool of 32 VM stores and one hypervisor is connected to 10 of them and one, the other hypervisor is connected to the other 20, we will still do our best. We will we'll solve you, but the problem. But you don't have to have a specific pool no. for a particular hypervisor. No, no. Yeah, right. the, the right. same, the, the pools are at the VM store yeah. level, not the data store pool level. We don't require you to sort of carve up a LUN and say this LUN is what's shared, uh, this volume is what's shared. We say, you know, what you're going to run out of resources on is the actual physical hardware. And so that's what the elements of the pool are. And you're aware of uh, VMware clustering as well in that regard. So it might be multiple VMware clusters that you need to maintain affinity to and that sort of thing. This is migration rules. Yeah, from a migration perspective. Uh, I, should, I should look into that because I'm not so, familiar with so it. I think where we're right going is can, can we set our own sort of affinity and anti-affinity rules to make sure we never move two things to the same system or to always keep them apart? Yes, there, we can set up sets of rules to, to we, we, govern what moves or doesn't move together. Yeah, we don't import rules from VMware, though. Um, we do, one of, the, one of the side benefits of actually asking VMware to do the storage migration is if there are any uh, restrictions at the storage, my storage uh, the motion layer or if the host is not actually connected to both stores like it should be, that'll just fail and there's no data outage. Uh, you know, if we just move things by ourselves, then we'd have to be very careful about does the host actually, is the host actually connected to everything? Again, it's recommended that it does, but there's no data outage if, if there's a mistake and, and we ask vCenter, vCenter just says, sorry, I can't do that. And this, and this is, you know, all based on uh, moving individual VMs. And this, I think, is fundamentally the right way to scale because, uh, like Kieran was talking about, there's no need for shells when you've got individual nodes, that, individual controllers that are s such large capacities. With Flash, individual controllers are such high I.O. Uh, providers, <coughs> have such high IOPS available that you don't need to, to uh, smear a VM across multiple controllers to get the throughput. You know, in sort of the disk-based environment, wide striping was very attractive because it, it gave you consistent performance at, by getting a lot of disks involved. With Flash, that's no longer a problem. So with this, could we... Um, um, 
Imagine we had to perform maintenance on one of the Tintry arrays. Could we evict everything that's on there and move it to other arrays that are there and then move it back over? That's a feature we discussed but didn't implement. Um, that, is, that is a feature that will come at some point. And I assume that we're going to see 64 node environments supported in the future. Yes. Uh, so the, I don't want to get too deep into Tintry Global Center, but we're actually... Our scale build limits are the number of VMs we can support, and so we didn't want to pr produce a number of VM stores that would overload that, but it's actually pretty easy for us to turn the VM store knob up as long as we leave the VM knob where it is. <laughs> yeah, our, go our goal is ultimately to get to a million VMs as kind of the internal target, but we also know that there are too many environments out there that are that large. Uh, and so even this kind of environment is actually bigger than I think most people will have. With some of the larger deployments though, I mean, they're, those nodes, those cluster sizes are past 32 because of the support just yeah, due we, to the automation. We, we have customers and, actually that have <coughs> like 75 nodes yep. today, so, um, but, but they don't manage them as, as, as one unit today.